Hello, everyone. This is Steve with the Wood Somebody Testify podcast. Today, I have with me brother Gary Wright, who's, uh, who's going to tell some of his. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Who's going to tell some of his family's history? So, welcome. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Good to have you. Good. I am uh, Gary Wright. I am the current director of North Alabama Holiness Youth Camp. I am 72 years old, so I'm not. I'm not youth, and when I start talking about my grandparents, we are talking about a long time ago. My uh, grandfather married my grandmother when she was 15 years old, and she had my dad when she was 16, and my dad was the oldest of 14 children. Two died as children, and uh, the remainder uh, are in church except for one. Uh, So, of course, some of them have died now, but they were in church when they died. Um, my, uh, grandmother got saved and well, actually my grandfather was a member of a missionary Baptist church and God dealt with him, uh, to get up and admit he wasn't saved and that he would save him. And he just felt like he couldn't do that. So when he left the church and he started walking across of course, they walked there where they went back then. Walking across this little bridge, the Spirit of God left him. And for nine years, God wouldn't even deal with him. Uh, and then towards the end of the nine-year period, uh, there, was, uh, there was a lady called Sister Whitten who really got a burden for him and, and uh, got preachers to pray for him and and so he started praying, and actually he was, at that time, the Baptists had revivals where they'd have a service in the morning and a service at night. And uh, so he he was praying in all these services, and, uh, you know, some people thought maybe he was crazy because he just kept coming and praying. But finally, God gave him the opportunity after nine years to be saved, and uh, he got saved, and uh, the very next night, he asked God, said, let me see what I missed by getting saved and missing hell. He wanted to see what he missed. And he didn't actually see it, but he felt the sensation of falling. I mean, you possibly felt, has people had a sensation of like, feel like they're falling out of the bed. But he, he felt that eternal falling. And we're excuse mm-hmm. that outer darkness, that and uh he of course he you know he told god so that's enough you know i'm you know i, I already i mean but the thing is he now he lived in in a in a holler that was full of bootleggers and uh rough people and uh god literally he rolled through cornfields and all briar patch and, and when it's all over he didn't have a scratch on him but in this process of of rolling and and it it attracted all the people in the holler come to see what was going on. And, uh, so even, uh, uh, he, uh, he wanted out of that situation. He, you know, he, he threw himself down in front of the car and asked him to run over him. <laughs> and, and, uh, the, one of the bootleggers said, if you do, I'll shoot you. But, uh, uh, after it was over, he would go to churches and, and testify about that experience. And he, would, uh, scare people to death. You know, that, uh, that experience of hell, of course, uh, hell is something to be a- afraid of. Uh, but my my grandparents uh, served the Lord uh, all their lives. And uh, my dad, who was the oldest child, uh, had good morals, didn't ever get out in, into the world and doing the things of the world. But he really, I mean, not what I'm saying is he didn't drink and all these kind of things. But... Uh, he didn't get saved. I think maybe he was 24 before he got saved. But uh, uh, his sister, just younger than him, uh, got saved in a revival. And uh, so uh, they persuaded my dad to come to church. And when he got there, uh, in the service he got there, there was there was a man that, uh, called Brother Cook. This guy had been a uh, steward in a Methodist church and a Baptist deacon. He was an older guy and, and was well respected in these churches, but he wasn't saved. I mean, 
And God was dealing with him as, as he did my grandfather, that if you'll just make it known that you're not saved, I'll save you. And uh, he had been at my grandparents' house, and I guess he discussed it with my, my grandfather. And uh, so uh, so they went to church that night, and this brother Cook was there. And God dealt with him one more time about making it known that he wasn't really saved. He'd save him, and he just couldn't do it. He just said, I can't. And the Spirit of God departed from him at that point in time. And then he started screaming, God has, Spirit has left me, and I'm going to die lost. The man literally walked out the door. There were two trees in the front yard, and he wrapped his hands around those trees and went round and round those trees screaming, the Spirit has departed me. And he went all the way around the city block, hollering, God has left me. I'm going to hell. When he, just a few minutes before, couldn't get up in front of Christian people and admit that he wasn't saved, now he was telling the whole world that he was lost and going to hell. And he ended up dying in a padded cell. But my dad was there, and he realized that that wasn't the way he wanted to go. He didn't want to be like that man. And somebody started walking back to invite him to the altar, and he said he knew in his heart if he waited till that man got there, he wouldn't go. He'd harden his heart. So he got up and went around the man and went to the altar. And, uh, of course, uh, my mother my mother now uh, was a, a member of a, of a large Baptist church at this time. And uh, uh, she went down to the altar as well but uh, uh, my dad got saved it, he didn't get saved that particular day but I mean he uh, he uh, he prayed I don't know how long he prayed but anyway uh, he was on the way to church and that you know they were praying and he's on the way to church and uh, God spoke to him and told him said now you when you get to church uh, when they do the prayer request, then you get up and make it known, and I'll save you. And so when he got to church, he couldn't wait till he got to the prayer request, and he, and he jumped up and said, the Lord told me that if I'd get up and make it known, that he would He would save me here tonight. And so, you know, they go down to the altar, and uh, he, all he prayed was, Lord, you said if, if I'd get up and make it known that, that you'd save me. You know, he said all these others were just praying away, you know, and he said that's all he said. And uh, so they got through praying, and he walked back to his bench, and uh, he uh, he thought, well, I'll just get up and you know rehearse it one more time. And when he got up and said, the Lord said, and then he said, he's already done it. He said, it's like his mother had the old washboard. I guess young people probably don't know what that is. It's a corrugated piece of metal that they washed their clothes on. And he said, as God just took his heart out and run it up and down that washboard, and uh Washed him, and then he uh, he was saved. And so my mother, uh, like I say, she was already a church member, but she wasn't saved either. And uh, so she she started praying. Now, this was a Free Will Baptist church that they were praying at. But uh, she prayed over every individual thing. Uh, she uh, she prayed over uh, her jewelry. And when she got willing to give her jewelry up, she prayed over makeup. She got willing to give her makeup up. Uh, she, uh, uh, I think the, I think maybe the last thing she prayed over was television. I was five years old, and and I liked Captain Kangaroo, so, she, so whatever that was. But anyway, she, uh, she prayed over giving the TV up. Uh, she prayed over hair. She prayed over everything. I mean. This you know, this what this is a woman that got sanctified praying <laughs> to get saved at a Baptist church, but anyway, uh, God came down and and gloriously saved her, and uh, uh, like I say I was five years old and uh, some time rolled on and the preacher's wife there was was her best friend, and the preacher's wife Asafkas was closing up, and uh, she could barely swallow, and. One morning, my mother really had a burden for her and was praying for her in the, at their home. And, and the ladies of the church met to clean the church. And so when they got through cleaning the church, uh, my mother asked uh, Sister Mary to go out to her house 
you know, with her. And uh, there was a Westland Methodist lady went out there with them. And they went out there and, and prayed, and, and I was in school. And so the Weston Methodist lady came to school to pick up her son and myself. And uh, Mary told my mother, said, uh, Satan's just tell me that I'm going to die and leave my kids. And uh, she said, let's go back in Gary's room. My, my room was in the middle of the house. And uh, pray one more time before I have to leave. And they got to praying. And uh, God came down and instantly healed that lady. I mean, she ate a whopper that night. Like she having problems swallowing water, and she ate a whopper that night. Mm-hmm. But in the in this in the same time, the Holy Ghost came down on my mother. Now, of course, my mother didn't realize it was the Holy Ghost per se. Uh, she believed that, like the Baptists believe, that you get it when when you get saved. And so, but the Holy Ghost come down on her, and uh, she was. She was so excited over God actually healing somebody. Uh, I mean, she shouted all over the place. I mean, she 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 had a time, you know, you know, with this this new experience of God healing somebody. Now they had uh, just because it was in the Bible, they had you know there at the church they had anointed her with oil and prayed for her, you know, because it was in the Bible. But God had actually come down and, and healed her, and. Uh, uh, Actually, from that point in time, uh, there was a uh, Church of Christ preacher who was preaching that healing was just for the uh, apostles' days. And she would listen to him on the radio and shout all over the house because she knew that it wasn't just for the apostles' days. It was it had been made real to her. And matter of fact, the lady that got healed, I think maybe only testified to it one time. But. Anytime I'd be off somewhere and, and uh, I remember it was in a brush harbor one time and it was it was it wasn't going very good. And so I got mother up to testify about Sister Mary getting healed. And uh, of course, she was always reluctant to do it, but she never could get through this through the story about Mary getting healed without the Holy Ghost falling on her and her shouting all over the place. But uh, uh, she she loved that healing so much. A matter of fact, that uh, uh and from that time on, she she loved to pray for people that, you know, that needed healing. And uh, she uh, there was a uh, there was a lady that was over in another state. And, uh, and she where she went to church with people that were kin to us. But she had a husband that was in other words, beat her for going to church. And but she was she was a godly woman and she had a disease she was dying of. And so they called my mother and to pray for this lady and uh my mother you know started fasting and praying for this lady and and uh i don't know how far into this fasting and praying was but uh the my dad said the holy ghost spoke through my mother in english for him he, and she said let me see and uh he said after that she went over and lay down on the couch and died you know, he watched her die. Now, she didn't literally die, but he saw the process of death of somebody taking their last last breath. And of course, my mother was had, was so set in her heart this woman be healed that she thought that this lady had just gone down to the point of death and God healed her. But uh, they got the call that the woman had died. But actually, I mean, me looking back, God was doing this woman a favor. Here was her husband that was beating her for going to church. And here she was leaving this world and going into that greater country that where all the there's nothing but joy there. And but he let my mother experience that because she was talking about what great peace she had when after she went through this process of, of dying, where she just she just entered into this great peace. And uh, but I'll digress a little bit. Uh, during this time period where whether my, my mother had this experience when when Mary got healed. Uh, my dad and, and my grandfather were, were arguing with each other because my dad believed, had been around the holiness people and believed that there was a baptism of the Holy Ghost. And my grandfather believed that, you know, you got the Holy Ghost when you got saved. And so they were, they were arguing with each other and, uh, had, uh, <clears throat> my dad gotten the Holy Ghost. I don't think my grandfather would have accepted it, uh, but 
My mother was such a meek woman. When she got the Holy Ghost, he wouldn't say a thing in the world against it. And uh, here, this uh, Free Will Baptist Church here, uh, uh, and uh, they, there was a small, I mean, that's where they were going, but there was a small holiness church that they went to on Saturday night from time to time. And there was a bunch of them from the church ended up down near that Saturday night. And there was an elderly lady come in and she was a large woman and had two people had to help her to get in the church. But the Holy Ghost got to moving and she started dancing. I mean, mother says just like she was floating across the floor. And that excited my mother so much you know, my mother jumped up and said, it's good for the young. It's good for the old. And God just filled her with the Holy Ghost right then and there. And uh, like I say, most of the church was there when, when she got it. And after that, uh, you know, uh, there was a younger sister that started seeking it and got it. The the pastor started seeking it and got it. Anyway, uh, it, was, it was a time. It wasn't too long until the church was only Baptist in name. I mean, right off, they had to they had a good standard they uh but they also had the gift of of the holy ghost now my mother had always just thought that the people at that church just had the gift of tongues because she thought she had the holy ghost all the time but but she found out that uh she didn't and she found out she did have it after it was given to her but uh i uh you know the reason i even thought of talking about this was because brother denver talking about timothy's grandmother and mother and talking about the advantages of uh, growing up in uh, a holiness environment. I, um, I grew up in that environment. I was five years old and my parents got saved. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> I um, was convinced as a child that it was right. Uh, I believe that they really took an old-fashioned salvation experience, and I believe that, you know, you needed to live the wholeness lifestyle. Now, that was instilled in me. And uh, um, there was, the church I went to, they were different beliefs in the church, and there was actually was there was conflict in the church at the time of uh, what I call holy wars. And uh, but they all, they don't accomplish any good. I can tell you that. But everybody in the church, my in my age group. Never prayed once. We we all grew up and left church without ever praying, not a single young person in this church prayed. I mean, the problem seemed like to me there was two problems. One, there was a conflict that they were fighting over. And the other thing was some of them had the attitude or the th thought process that you, you had to go out and sow your wild oats before oh, you got Lord. saved. Matter of fact, uh, I know one that just didn't believe that young people could get saved. And uh, so we... I said, none of us prayed. We all grew up and uh, and left church. But I, uh, it was in my heart to get saved and to live holiness. And so I never dated any of the girls I went to school with because I felt like that when I got saved, they would not accept uh, the lifestyle that was in my heart. Now, I mean, I was a sinner and all <laughs> that, but uh, still, I I had the intention, you know, there was going to be a day I was going to get saved. And I wanted somebody that I believed would, you know, would get saved as well. I met this girl when I was 14 years old. Uh, she was, uh, she didn't claim to be a Christian. Uh, she went to church with her brother to a, a, a church and, uh, the kids there, that church had an attitude. And well, our brother was dating a girl there, but the kids had an attitude like, you know, you're not from the right section of town to be coming to this church. 
And uh, so needless to say, she, you know, she wasn't saved. She she didn't claim to be saved. She didn't claim nothing. And uh, I would carry to church with me. And my mother, Holy Ghost would move with my mother. She'd shout her hair down and speak in tongues and dance. And and uh, my this girlfriend was, was tender towards the moving of God. And matter of fact, on the way home, she uh, she told me, she said, uh, said, if you don't want me to, said, I won't wear makeup. And I was already heading the wrong direction. I, I told her, I said, well, I want you to quit when, when you want to quit. Now, she wore very little. Her parents didn't go to church, but her dad was very strict on her. Matter of fact, when she was engaged to me and uh, was she she'd gone to school and become an x-ray technician and was paying for paying her own phone bill. Of course, back then, you, you was plugged in the wall. Nobody had a cell phone <laughs> back then. But uh, she was only allowed to talk to me, and we were engaged 15 minutes a day. So I say her her dad was really strict, but uh, uh, I felt like that when you know when I got saved that she would she would too. Uh, and I need to digress back to when I was in high school. Uh, I went to work when I was sixteen. I worked uh, year round, and uh, the summer before I was a senior, I bought I graduated in nineteen seventy. I bought a 69 GTO, brand new. I had half of it saved up, and I borrowed the rest of it from my dad and turned around and paid him back. And uh, I went to a very small high school, so uh, I was on an ego trip. I mean, I, I mean, I had I had this new high-performance car, and it's a small school, and and uh, uh, but I asked God. I said, "Please don't deal with me when I'm in high school because." I really want to be saved, and I am afraid that if you deal with me, I will turn you away because of peer pressure. He did not deal with me till I was 24 years old. And uh, by that time, well, we got we got married when I was uh, I was just fixing to turn 20. But uh, and I was at that point I was you know getting married going. Leave, you know, don't go back to church and all this stuff. And but I woke up on a Sunday morning and uh, insisted we go to church. My wife didn't want to go that morning, but I insisted, and we went. And the preacher preached, uh, you know, to the lost. Uh, didn't didn't phase me. I, you know, God wasn't dealing with me. And uh, the parking lot was behind the church, and so we went back through the church through a hallway out to the parking lot. And the pastor stopped us uh, at the door or before we went out, and he said, said, you really need to get saved. said, you don't have the promise of living to 1 o'clock. Uh, well, it made my wife mad. said it embarrassed her. Nobody ever done that before. And so anyway, uh, that night, uh, she, she was mad at me and uh, because I insisted we go. And so that night, during the night, I, I moved over next to her in the bed, and she pulled away and fell out of the bed, hit her head on the dresser and knocked herself out just for a moment. But when she opened her eyes, it was 1 o'clock. And uh, she crawled back in bed with a little bit of different attitude than she had, When, but she said she would never go back to that church again. Of course, that was a church I grew up in, and uh, and also, let me explain this. I was talking about as far as, uh, see, all the girls I went to church with, I was kin to. So that's, I wasn't any, it, and also, I mean, I direct a youth camp now. But at that time, I didn't even know anything about youth camps. And uh, the only homeless girl I knew, I went to college with her, and she uh, was very rebellious. I mean, she she hated holiness. Uh and of course, she knew the, of course, the church I went to, and and uh, you know, uh, matter of fact, she uh, had her boyfriend tell me to come talk to her, and uh, she had a, had a dream that I'd gotten saved, and and in her dream, she was trying to get me to drink and all this other stuff, uh, but uh, like I said, that was that was the only holiness girl I knew, so. In my heart, I was looking for somebody who would 
who would serve the Lord. We went out turned. And this was the only girl that, that, uh, I felt like there that would. And, uh, uh, and as I, I even I have told her myself, there was, I mean, since the time we were divorced, I have told her that, of course, I told her I was wrong in, in uh, uh, asking God not to deal with me when I was when I was in high school and how that uh, had uh, uh, he uh, you know had I not done that, he had dealt with me. She would have had to accept it or reject me then. And plus, at that time, she was tender towards towards uh holiness and uh uh so that in other words well, i like to tell young people uh this is extremely something you need to be careful about is first off you really need to get saved as soon as you can because there's decisions that's going to affect your life from then on and uh uh in other words I the decisions I made, in other words, have is is where I'm at, and that's one of the reasons why I direct a youth camp is because, well, first off, it was a desire of my heart, and God gave it to me, but I like to tell the young people, you know, you've got an opportunity that I didn't have. Don't waste it. Uh, you know, get in and and get saved, get the Holy Ghost, and 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 marry somebody that God directs you to marry. I mean, I do know people that met under church uh, at church functions and stuff, and or you know that are not together now because they didn't follow the Lord. And uh, you you got to get in this thing and stay with, it. and you also got to find somebody else that's going to get it and stay with with you. But uh, let's see where I need to go from here. Hang on a second. <clears throat> uh, Okay, all right. Uh, I all right. I I told you about us going to church, and I'll start back there. So uh, after went to church, she, you know, she told me she wasn't going to go back to that church. Well, I wasn't interested in going to another church because I didn't know of another church at that time that was was holding us. Like I said, I didn't know anything about the churches that we've associated with now. We were we. We were free will Baptists, just we were holiness, but we, we were free will Baptists in name. And uh, uh, so I wasn't interested in going to church. Uh, so I worked six days a week and went water skiing on Sunday. And um, uh, when two, two people are married, one has a stronger personality than the other one. And that was the case with my wife. She, her personality was stronger than mine. And uh, she kept insisting we go to church. Well, I finally gave in. And we went to uh, a church a guy I went to school with. It was uh, 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 Nazarene. And in other words, it was a, a conservative. In other words, it was conservative. I mean, it was, it was actually, was I, I guess it was actually probably Westland Methodist, but uh, it was his mother that uh, was there when I was telling about the lady that went to pick us up at school when Mary got healed. Anyway, there was, we went from this conservative church, and we, you know, each, we uh, uh, ended up at uh, a church. I'm not going to name it, but it was a, it was a Baptist church, and uh, it was it was really a social club. They, they had... Um, uh, swim parties where, uh, you know, the male and the female members swim together and, and my wife wouldn't go because she didn't have a one piece bathing suit. She didn't think that she ought to go to, 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 uh, that, you know, without a one piece bathing suit. But anyway, uh, we, uh, time it had rocked on after we got married there and we, uh, and we started going to that church I was telling you about. And uh, uh, I always said that I wouldn't go to a church that had a baseball team. You know, I, I, I just didn't believe that that was right. And, uh, you know, this church had a baseball team. And, and uh, uh, I went, I was in the guard. I went to uh, drills one weekend and I come back and my wife had joined the church. Uh, and uh, they were they were pressuring me to to join the church i uh 
I mean, here I was, I said I wouldn't go to one, and here I was attending every service. So one Sunday, leaving the church, the uh, pastor asked me, said, uh, said, Gary, where's your letter at? You know, we wanted to know where I, what church I was a member of, trying to get me to move it there. And, and I told him, I said, I'm not a Christian. He said, well, maybe you can become one uh, next, next Sunday. And, uh, and, and, you know, uh, under my breath, I'm saying, well, you're not either because the preacher smoked. <laughs> so I didn't, I didn't have no confidence in this, this preacher because, like I say, the, the preacher smoked. Uh, you know, that's just where I was at. But anyway, uh, that's how God started dealing with me. See, I, I always had intention of getting saved. It's just not now. And so I... I realized that I said I would never go to church like that. And I realized that I was going every service and they were pressuring me to accept it. I didn't believe that I could accept it, but I also realized I was already doing something that I said I wouldn't do. So I, uh, and my wife was very happy at this church because the difference was when she went to church, uh, as a youth, they had the attitude, well, you're not in the right part of town to be in this church. Well, this church had the attitude like, where have you been? We need you to work with our youth, you know, and and she was accepted and, 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 and loved it. And I, uh, I was, you know, I was perplexed. And so I knew that it was, it was going to create problems, so I, I told God, I said, I really want to know that you are dealing with me. And uh, because I knew what I was facing. So I went over to my parents' house and I pulled in the driveway, had a customized van with a painting on the side. And uh, and uh, I uh, pulled up next to the carport and somebody pulled in behind me and I didn't pay attention. I cut it off in drive and uh so i went in and for a little bit and i came back and got in the van and turned the key and nothing happened well i didn't think anything about it because i had a solenoid problem on this van and i had a ratchet laying under the seat where i've been shorting it out to crave excuse me <laughs> real quick while i'm thinking about it, you said uh, you were out for uh drills for a couple of days um, yeah, guard drill. Guard. National Guard. Okay. So, all right, I <clears throat> had a ratchet laying on the seat to uh, short the solenoid out, so I grabbed it, and I raised the hood, and I got all the linkage on the carburetor, and I filled the carburetor full of gas, and uh, with one hand, I'm holding the hood up, and with the other one, I reach over and short out the solenoid. Only problem is, it is in drive. And it cranks. And uh, it uh, tore the side of my parents' car out. It uh, knocked a, a pole out that was holding the carport. And it hit, um, there was a tiller sitting in front of a four inch rise on the concrete going into the utility room. It hit that tiller and it was sitting there spinning. One moment I had been standing in front of it. The next moment, I was standing beside it, watching it go through the wall. And uh, my mother, I mean, I walked over and cut it off. But my mother came out of the house speaking in tongues. And uh, number one, I knew God was dealing with me. Number two, I knew this was the last time he was going to deal with me. So I, uh, <clears throat> I went that very day and got rid of things at the house that I knew I wasn't supposed to have. And uh, uh, so that I was working second shift, and uh, uh, the church that I grew up in uh, was in revival. <clears throat> but, well, I guess it started after Easter. But uh, uh, my wife had uh, bought me a suit and made her a matching outfit, and uh, I had promised her I would go to church for uh, Easter Sunday. But I got up and went to sunrise service at the church I grew up in. And uh, 
uh, I started praying that that morning, and uh, then I uh, that that sunrise service, and I went to, went to church with my wife at the church that she was going to, and I went back to the church that I grew up in on Sunday night, and uh, I should have got saved that night. I was I was praying. And uh, I had my hands up, uh, and and I looked up towards heaven, and there was only one thing between me and heaven was my wedding band. And my wife had told me, said, if you take that wedding band off, I'm going to divorce you. But at that point in time, I reached up and took that wedding band off and stuck it in my pocket. And I reached a point where that uh, the the spirit the and the began to move the joy of the lord began to come and a person came and told me said you know you know this it's not right it, the bible says when zion travails uh said you got to travail to get saved you know get get back down there and travail i mean i was almost at the point to get saved and somebody with the wrong knowledge uh led me in the wrong direction and i prayed Monday night and Tuesday night and like I say then and I came back Wednesday night and uh Wednesday morning when I woke up uh, there was a war going on at my house because like I said my wife had found what she wanted and I was I was messing everything up and uh we had slept in two different bedrooms and when I woke up that morning, I heard an audible voice say, Rejoice, for thy time is nigh. And I, I called my mother, and I, I told her about it. I said, uh, maybe that means God's going to save me tonight. And uh, I got to church. Well, all these nights I'd been praying, I wasn't getting anywhere because, uh, I mean, I'd been sent down the wrong pathway, really. And uh, so on uh, Wednesday night, uh, I had a uncle that was two years older than me who had had been a drug addict before he got saved uh he uh he went back in the in the back and was praying and god gave him a scripture and uh he came and he told me he said uh god gave me the scripture scripture says in one in psalms 119 and 9 says wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed according to thy word i may not quote that exactly right but anyway he said, God's told you to do something that you're not willing to do. Well, my mother spoke up and said, uh, no, the Lord told him to rejoice for his time was nigh. Well, they were both right. I mean, I wasn't, I wasn't willing to rejoice because, I mean, my whole life was falling apart. Plus, But anyway, when uh, she said that, the Holy Ghost started moving, and everybody started rejoicing, and so did I. And when I started rejoicing, I felt my spirit leave and start going up and uh one more time i asked god to save me and when i did it stopped and i thought that's not what i want and i started praising him again started rejoicing again and uh when i started rejoicing again i felt myself start going again and i knew the very moment i changed worlds and uh i like i say i knew i was i was, I was saved uh uh and uh the deal is when God tells somebody to do something, uh, you're not, I mean, I would have never gotten saved until I rejoiced. He had instructed me what to do. And once I started rejoicing, it's when I got saved. And it's the same thing with people that's sick in the Holy Ghost. If, if God tells you to do something, you're not going to get it until you do what he tells you. Obedience is better than sacrifice. But, uh, uh, I got saved on, on, on Wednesday night and uh, 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 got saved pretty early, matter of fact, because uh, my wife had gone to church and I beat her home and I was sitting at the table when she walked in and she said, um, what happened to you? I hadn't said a word. And I told her, she said, said I believe you. And uh, she divorced me, but mistakes I made really caused it. I mean, even that that very that very night, I made a mistake. I mean, I 
none of it was intentional, but but I made mistakes that night that that uh, uh, had I not made them, I'm, I I really believe that uh, we would have worked things out and would still be together. Uh, and uh, but uh, I've been divorced this this summer will be 48 years and uh, I have been true to my marriage vow through the whole thing and uh, I have not given up on she and I serving God together Um, I uh, I still really believe it's going to happen to tell you the truth um when I was been saved, I was young, saved, and which I got saved at 24. I went to visit an elderly lady in the hospital, an old saint who was dying. And uh, there was a preacher came in at the same time I did, and he was divorced as well. And uh, she told him, uh, preach the truth. Uh, don't fear the people. Uh, but it wasn't that long after that till he married again, so I questioned how much truth he was preaching. But anyway, uh, she turned to me and she said, God's going to give you the desires of your heart. I had two. I One, I wanted to direct a youth camp. And I've been directing a youth camp since uh, 2011. And uh, the other one was that uh, God would put our marriage back together, that we could serve him in the beauty of holiness. So uh, I have, like I say, I've, I've, I am thrilled that I've had the opportunity to direct this youth camp. I have seen many young people get saved and receive the Holy Ghost and Matter of fact, there was a there was a lady who uh, um, was kind of upset with me because I just didn't go on with with my wife in in that church. And I mean, she was a godly lady, but anyway, and but her daughter went to that church. And uh, but any, anyway, she didn't tell me, but other people did. God either showed her a vision or a dream one. And said that I was surrounded by young people praying like she had never seen people pray. And I have experienced that uh, more than once. I mean, these these there was one particular youth camp where <clears throat> at that time we didn't have our dorms built. And we were housing the boys at uh, our church and uh, had, a, had a rock building where we had housed boys in. And the girls were housed there at the church where we had the youth camp. And the boys had to travel back and forth in vans. And uh, one of the vans didn't have air conditioning. And uh, we had, there's a preacher driving it. And uh, his name is David Gamble. And uh, God was dealing him about singing a song. Uh, and it was the land of perfect day. That's what it was. I mean, it's not a song you'd sing at youth camp. So he started singing it in the van, and uh, the boys joined in with him, and the Holy Ghost came down in the van. And there's a, a on this particular road he was on, there's a big old long 90-degree curve. And uh, they were coming up on it, and Brother Gamble had his eyes closed. He had uh, his uh, left hand was out the window, and his right hand was up over the uh, counselor sitting in the passenger seat. And they were meeting a truck, pickup truck. That van went around that curve perfectly, met that truck and come around on on past it. And uh, he opened his eyes, reached down, got the steering wheel. And he didn't believe what, you know, what the boys were telling him had happened uh, till the counselor sat beside him, told him it was true. But they got there. And uh, he walked in, and they, they told him to lead the first song, and he got up and started leading the song of the Land of Perfect Day, and the Holy Ghost fell. And uh, uh, 
I don't think the preacher got to say a word that night, uh, but God came down. Uh, I think they may have actually even got the choir up, but his, the Holy Ghost fell in the youth choir. <clears throat> but I stood up there and held on to the pulpit, and there were kids all around me, I mean, praying, and I was crying like a baby. I mean, um, I was just, I was, I don't, there was a bunch got the Holy Ghost that night. And there was kids slain out in the floor, and I was just, like I say, it was just, it's something I won't ever forget how it was just, I mean, it, I felt, uh, you know, unworthy that God would do this. You know, I mean, I'm, and I'm not saying that, <laughs> that, that I'm the reason it happened. I'm just saying I didn't feel like that. Well, I'm just, I mean, is I, we've got great board members and great people and they've, they've done a great job, but it's just, it just, it just, what God was doing that night just melted my heart. And, uh, uh, you know, I've seen him move time and time again and just, uh, you know, how he's, uh, how he's touched hearts and lives. And, uh, it's, uh, it's been a wonderful experience, but I'm still looking ahead to the experiences of God that's going to, it's going to do. All right. I'm done. <laughs> well, thank you for coming, coming on and thank you all for listening.